We have an early flight from Lima and arrive in Cusco at 7 a.m. We stop at the Libertador Hotel and drop off our bags. It's an old monastery and is filled with colonial era artifacts. Cusco's at almost 12,000 feet and I'm feeling it. We take the local cure, coca tea. Sherry's doing better than I am, but takes the cure anyway. And Judy and Mike are doing just fine. We have some time to kill, so we head down an ancient street to the main square. Cusco was the capital of the Inca Empire until the Spanish conquest. The Spanish were impressed by the town's layout with straight streets and a large town square. They kept the layout but destroy the Inca buildings, replacing them with churches and residences for the conquerors. We'll have another chance to explore later. Now our bus waits to take us to the Urubamba Valley. This is the sacred valley of the Incas. It's a rich, fertile valley that supported the Inca urban centers like Cusco. Our first stop is Chinchero, which is famous for its textiles. This man shows us how they make a natural soap from yucca and use it to wash the wool. The process of dyeing the wool starts here with cochineal, a scale insect that feeds on prickly pear cactus. When the cochineal is dried and ground, the result is a carmine dye. The wool is dipped into boiling water with the dye and it emerges Carmen. These women are demonstrating how llama or alpaca wool is spun into thread. A wide color spectrum is available from dyes made from natural sources like purple corn, coca leaves, salts, and beans. Fabric is woven on a string loom by two women. Belts are woven on a backstrap loom. Then the edge is woven onto the fabric to finish it. Our next stop is the Chinchero Market with an amazing quantity and variety of fabrics and clothing. We continue on into the heart of the Irobamba Valley. The soil is rich looking from centuries of cultivation. Glacier-clad peaks frame the valley. But in recent years, the glaciers have receded at an alarming rate. You can still see the Inca terraces on the hillsides. We have arrived at the floor of the valley and the town of Uke. We check into our hotel, the Pasado de Uke, which was originally a convent. It's a beautiful and tranquil place. Time to sample the products of the valley at lunch. Our guides have something special for us this afternoon. We're visiting Willick, a Quechua village. On the hillsides, we see more Inca terraces and try to imagine how intense the agriculture was. The village is isolated and has managed to maintain its lifestyle and customs better than most. The only car we see is ours. Almost all the people are wearing traditional clothes. The women of the village have laid out their handiwork. The women are painfully shy and sit on the sidelines. Only when you express interest in their product will they approach you, quite different from the hubbub of the Chinchero market. The teacher works hard to corral the boys. The kids are excited. They know we bring a special treat for them. Not candy, but bread, which is not usually part of their diet. Then dodging sheep, we make our way down the narrow road and back to UK and our hotel for dinner. In the morning, we're on the road again, this time headed to Oyantantambo. The valley is a very picturesque place.
you know, Yantan Tombo, our guide, Michel, says we need to know more about the Incas before we get to Machu Picchu. And this is the place to learn. These streets were built by the Incas. Off this Inca street, Michel directs us into a courtyard, then into an old house. The cooking fire in the corner is putting out a lot of heat and smoke. Before our eyes adjust to the darkness, we hear a scurrying about our feet. They're guinea pigs, a staple of the Inca diet. We're in an old Inca house. High on the wall are two ancestral skulls. Michelle explains the altar and the various objects on it. Recovering from our trip back in time, we head to the Ollantaytambo archaeological site. Michelle explains that this temple complex was built in the mid 15th century. The lower terraces are constructed with field stones. The temples are made of fitted quarried stones. At the top is the Temple of the Sun. From the terraces, you can see old storehouses and a face carved in the rock. This is the face of Wiracocha, the creator god. Back in the lower area, Michelle explains the princess fountain and the symbolism of the Inca cross. We walk through more ceremonial buildings at the base of the terraces. There are two ways to get to Machu Picchu. Hike the Inca Trail or take the train. We choose the train. The narrow gauge railroad was built between 1907 and 1927. The tracks follow the Urubamba River. On the other side of the river, we see hikers on the Inca Trail. Constructing this railroad was no easy task. More terraces along the way. They may have been used to feed the residents of Machu Picchu. We arrive at the end of the rail line at Aguas Caliente. We're eager to get to Machu Picchu, so we take the bus to the ruins and have lunch at Tinkoy Restaurant, just outside the gate. We go through the tourist gate and follow Michel to the House of the Guardians, for the best panoramic view of the site. The residential area is divided by the main square into an upper town with the royal compound and the temples and the lower town with residences, factories, and warehouses. Below us is the agricultural zone where the food was grown for the residents. A thousand feet or more below us is the Urubamba River. The agricultural terraces make up only about 12 acres of land, not enough to support the estimated 750 plus people living on Machu Picchu. So most of the food was imported from the terraces we saw from the train. Llamas are the groundskeepers here, mowing the lawns every day. From the House of the Guardians, we walk down to the level of the residential area. Ahead of us is the royal compound, and beyond that, the temple area. The royal compound is in the foreground. The temple of the sun is part of the royal compound. The windows are placed to align with the summer solstice and specific star constellations from the Inca zodiac. The royal palace is distinguished from the other structures by its high quality masonry. Above the royal compound is the temple area. This is the temple of three windows with its finely crafted stonework. The windows look out to the south to Huayna Picchu. From here you can see Intihuatana, a ritual stone associated with the Inca calendar. The Intihuatana is carved directly into the bedrock of the summit of the mountain. Its purpose is unknown, but it is aligned with the sun's position on the winter solstice. In the main temple, Michel explains how these circular carvings in the floor were probably filled with water and used as mirrors to observe the sky. These niches in the main temple may have been used to display mummies of the past rulers on special occasions. The residential zone is divided by the central square. At the highest level of the lower town 
are the houses of the factories. Next is the industrial zone where weavers and carvers may have worked. The lowest part of the lower town is the Condor Temple behind the large rock outcropping. In front of it is the prisoner area where offerings to the gods were kept. This condor shape is the altar of the condor temple where sacrificed llamas and possibly humans were left for the condors to feed on. Machu Picchu was built on two fault lines. This wall shows how resistant Inca masonry is to earthquakes. The rocks moved, but they are locked together and the wall stands. Another surprise was that wild orchids grow in Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is a magical and some say mystical place. If you're planning on visiting, my advice is to get a good guide because most of the magic is hidden. And of course good traveling companions are essential. Machu Picchu gets 71 inches of rainfall annually. We've been lucky so far to have a pleasant day, but the clouds are moving in and it's starting to drizzle. So we leave Machu Picchu to the llamas.